Hey guys, welcome back. We'll continue with the book Python for Data Analysis. And in this video, we're going to cover how we can join, arrange, and reshape data using pandas. This is part of a multi-part series, so feel free to subscribe to the channel to not miss any videos. Let's jump right in. Let's learn how we can join, combine, and reshape our data. If you want to follow along, you can head over to westmckinney.com book and read the book for free. We're going to start out by covering hierarchical indexing. Then we're going to learn how we can combine and merge datasets. And finally, we're going to cover reshaping and pivoting. Now, in a lot of applications, the data may be spread across a number of different files and databases. And we need to first combine, join, and rearrange the data in order to further analyze it. And the first concept we're going to cover in order to do this is hierarchical indexing. Hierarchical indexing is an important feature that Pandas provides and it enables us to have multiple index levels on an axis. So basically we can work with higher dimensional data in a lower dimensional form. And let's have a look at an example. For that we can open up our terminal and open IPython. And as before we're going to import Pandas and we're also going to import NumPy. After that, we can create a simple series object. For that, we are going to use NumPy's random function in order to create nine random digits between zero and one. And we're also specifying the index with nine different values. So if we look at our series object, we can see this is our output here. We have our index label A, B, C, and D. Then our index next to it. And next to that, we have our random numbers between zero and one. And another way to display our index is to use the index attributes that we're going to call on data and this displays the different index values. So for instance, first we have index label A and index 1, then index label A again with value 2 and so on and so forth. Now using this hierarchical indexing where we have basically two different index levels, we can use so-called partial indexing in order to concisely select certain subsets of our data. So for instance, if we only want to have a look at our data with index label B, we can simply use this notation here. And this is going to give us back those two values here, which refer to the index label B. We can of course also refer to multiple of these subsets. So for instance, we can have a look at index label B and index label C. So those four values here. And this is exactly what we get back. And we can not only select from the outer hierarchical level, so A, B, C, or D, but also from the inner level. So for instance, we could have a look at all the values which have an index of two. So this would, for example, be this row here, this row, as well as this row. And if you look at that, those are exactly the three rows we are going to get back. And hierarchical indexing plays an important role in reshaping data and in-group based operations, like for example, forming a pivot table. So for example, we can go ahead and we can rearrange the data that we just created into a data frame instead of a series object by using the unstack method. So as an example, we can simply call unstack on our data, and this is going to give us back a data frame object instead of a series object. And of course, we can also do the reverse. So we could first turn our series object into a data frame object by calling unstack as we just did up here, but then we can use the stack method, which basically does the reverse. So turning our data frame object back into a series object. So we would get our original series object back. Now with the data frame object, either axis can have a hierarchical index. So as an example, we can create a new data frame object, which is going to have four rows and three columns. And of course we are specifying both the index as well as the column names. Now, if we take a look at our data frame object, we can see that both axes have a hierarchical index. So just as with our series object before, we have our label A here and the associated index. And if we look at the columns, we also have a hierarchical index with the values of Ohio and Colorado, and then on the inner hierarchy, green, red, and green. Now those hierarchical levels also can have names. So we can go ahead and we can call index.names on our frame, and then specify the index name, for example, key one and key two. And we can also assign column names by calling columns.names on our frame object, and setting it to state and color. Now, if we take a look at our frame object again, we can now see that we have key one and key two displayed for the different rows and state and color are displayed for our columns. We can also have a look at how many levels our index have by calling frame.index.nlevels. And here we can see that we have indeed two levels for our index. So key one and key two and state and color respectively. 
And we can also use partial column indexing to select groups of columns. So for instance, we can have a look at the columns for Ohio. So in this case, this would be the first two columns. And these are exactly then the columns we get back. We can also go ahead and create a multi-index. So in order to create the columns for the preceding data frame with the associated level names, we would use this syntax here. Again, we can see our column names, Ohio and Colorado, and then on the inner level, green, red, and green. And we also specify the names, state, and color that we assigned after we created the data frame, but this would be a way to create that in a single step. Sometimes we may need to rearrange the order of the levels on the axis or sort the data by values in one specific level. And for that, we can use the swap level method. Let's have a look at an example. Here we can see our data frame that we created previously with our two hierarchies that we created. We can now use the swap level method and pass our two index values, key one and key two as an argument. And if we do so, we are going to swap key two and key one in our data frame. We can also decide how our keys should be sorted. By default, they would be sorted alphabetically. So first A and then B, but we can use the sort index method in order to change this. So here we are sorting just by a single level and we can now see that our data set is sorted numerically. So key two is sorted by one, one, two, two, and for key one, it's no longer sorted alphabetically. We can also combine our swap level method with our sort index method, and then switch both the order of key one and key two, as well as sort numerically. We can also create summary statistics by level. And for that, many descriptive and summary statistics for series and data frame objects have a level option in which we can specify the level that we want to aggregate by on a particular axis. So for an example, we can have a look at our data frame and we can use the group by method and then specify the level we want to group by. So in this case, we want to group by key two and we're going to use the sum method in order to sum up the values. Now, if we look at the result, we can see that we are grouping by key two. So the values for same key are summed up and displayed here in this row. And the same is of course true for key two. So here as well, we are summing up the different values. So for example, nine and three gives us 12 and so on and so forth. We can of course also sum based on the columns. For that, we can specify the axis and set it to columns. And of course we need to decide what level we're going to group by. So in this case, we are grouping based on the color. So whether it's green or red. And if you look at that, we can see we now have two columns displayed, green and red. And as before, the values are summed up based on the different column names. Now, when we work with data frames, we can use one or more of the columns in the data frame as a row index. And alternatively, we could move the row index into the data frames columns. So for an example, let's create a new data frame. And our data frame is going to have four different columns labeled A, B, C, and D, and seven different rows. So if you look at our data frame, this is what it looks like. And using our data frame, we can now use the set index method to create a new data frame using one or multiple of its columns as the index. So in this case here, we are going to use column C and D as the index and going to create a new data frame object called frame two. So looking at this, we can see that C and D are indeed our index and A and B are still displayed as our columns in here. So when we use the set index method, by default, the columns that we set as an index, so in this case, C and D, are removed from the data frame. But if we want to avoid that, we can use the set index method and set the optional argument drop to false. So in this case, those columns would still be displayed in our data frame. And if you want to undo the action we did with set index, we can use the reset index method instead. This is going to reset our data frame to its original state and remove the indexes we set before. We can also combine and merge data sets using pandas. And for that, we have three different methods available to us. The first one is pandas merge, which connects rows in a data frame based on one or more keys. And this is quite similar to SQL's join operation. The second option is to use pandas concat, which concatenates or stacks objects together along an axis. And the third option is to use the combined first method which splices together overlapping data to fill in missing values in one object with values from another. So let's start out with the pandas merge function in order to use a database style data frame combination. And for an example, we are first going to create two different data frame objects. The first one has two different columns, key and data one. 
and seven different rows. It's of type in 64. And our second data frame is also going to have two columns, key and data two, but only three rows. Now we can have a look at our data frame. So this is data frame one with our seven different rows and two columns. And then we have data frame two again with two columns and three rows and both are of data type in 64. Now in order to combine those two data frames, we can use the merge method, which is part of pandas. And here we are specifying our two data frames, data frame one and data frame two as the arguments. Now, if we look at the result, we can see that we now have three columns, key, data one and data two. And looking back at our data frames, we can basically see that the columns have been combined. So key is the same one for both data frames and then data one and data two are the columns respectively. And if you look at the rows, we have the letters A, B and C for first data frame and A, B and D for second data frame. Now the merge function here joined our data based on the key column. And we can see that in the key column, only those letters are used which are included in both of our data frames. So A and B. D is not included because it's not included in our first data frame. And also C is not included because it's not included in the second data frame. And we can see that for the key A, data two has a value of zero. So whenever we have an A here, the value for data two is set to zero. And for key B, the value is one. Therefore, one is displayed in the data two column. Now, when we use the merge function here, we did not specify which column to join on. And if we don't specify that, then the pandas merge function is always going to join on the combined column. So in our case, the key column, which is included in both data frames but it's typically a good idea to make that more explicit. So therefore we can add the optional argument on and then specify which column we want to join on. So this is basically the same as before. Here we're specifying that we want to join on the key column. Now we can of course also have the case that the columns of our data frame objects we want to join are different. So here's an example. We are creating two data frames and the first data frame has the columns L key and data one. And the second data frame has the columns R key and data two. Now in such a case, we would specify which columns to join on separately. So again, we are going to use our merge function specifying the data frames we want to join. And then we can specify which ones we want to join on. So we want to join on L key and R key. And here we can see our results. So in this case, we have the L key column here and the R key column. We have the data one and the data two column. And as before, we are only displaying those rows here which have combined values. So again, A and B are the combined values. Values such as C and D, which are only included in one of the data sets, would not be included in the merged result. And this result that we are only combining values that are included in both data frames is called an inner join. There are other options available. So for instance, a left join, a right join and an outer join. So as an example, we can merge data frame one and data frame two. And as an optional argument, we are going to specify outer so that we're using an outer join. This is going to display all of the values. So if we think back, we had data frame one and data frame two, data frame one had seven rows and data frame two had three rows. And here we're basically combining them all. So we can see we have the values for A and B as before, but also for C and D. And C, of course, was not included in the second data frame and D was not included in the first one. Therefore, the value not available will be displayed. And of course, we can also do the same for our data frame three and data frame four. So here we are again joining those two data frames using two separate column names. And we are going to specify the outer join. And again, we can see we have eight different columns here. And if a value is not available, we are going to get back NA. And since we're using different column names, not the same one, we would get NAN if we don't have a letter for R key or L key. So far, we covered many to one joins because we always joined data frames on a single column displaying the results, but we can also use many to many mergers. And that forms the Cartesian product of the matching keys. So let's have a look at an example. And as before, we can create two separate data frame objects. So again, we have data frame object one, which has two columns, key and data. And we have data frame object two with the columns key and data two. And of course we can look at those data frame objects again. Here we can see the first one has six different rows and the second one has five different rows. Now in order to join those two data frames using a many to many merge, we would specify the whole argument and set it to left. And again, we're specifying that we are going to join on our key column. Now this left join uses all key combination found in the left table. 
So if you look at key B, for instance, we can see that in our result, we have four and then two, so six rows. And if we look back at our data frame object, we can see that we have three rows with value B in data frame one and two rows with key B in data frame two. So three times two would give us six. And that's exactly the number of rows we have with key B, which is displayed. And the way this works is as follows. We're going to start out with the first data frame where B has a value of zero. And then we're going to combine it with B with a value of one, B with a value of three. Then we're going to continue with the second row here, key B and a value of one, combined with B with a value of one and B with a value of three from the second data frame and so on and so forth. And this way we get this result back. So key B in data one is value of zero and then data two a value of one. Then again, we're using the same one from data frame one. And there's a second value for B in data frame two, which is set to three and so on and so forth. And here's a quick overview of the different join types that we can use with the how argument. We saw the inner option before, which is the default option that only uses the key combination observed in both tables. We also saw outer before, which uses all key combination observed in both tables together. And we just covered left, which uses all key combinations found in the left table. And then there's also right, which uses all key combinations found in the right table. We can also merge with multiple keys. So for an example, let's create two different data frames. We first have our data frame left with the columns key one, key two, and elver. And then we have a second data frame right, which also has three columns, key one, key two, and rvel. And as before, we can use the merge function here to join both data frames. And in the on optional argument, we are specifying multiple columns we want to join on. So in this case, key one and key two inside of a list. In this case, we are going to use the outer join. And here we can see the result. So we have key one and key two. We joined on both of them. And since we use the outer option here, we use all the key combinations in both data frames. And one last issue we need to consider when we use merge operations is overlapping column names. So if you look at our two data frame objects from before left and right, we can see that they have the same column names, key one and key two, and only LVEL and RVEL are different columns. Now, if you're going to join both of those data frames on a single key, so on key one, we of course would run into issues if key two is displayed for both of those data frames and we cannot tell which one is which. So by default, Panda is going to add a suffix. So in this case here for the first data frame underscore X is added and for the second data frame underscore Y, so we can tear them apart. But to make this more explicit, we can also specify an optional argument suffixes and then specify which kind of suffix should be used for our data frames. So here we are going to use underscore left and underscore right as the suffixes to denote our columns from data frame left and right. So looking at that, we can see that now instead of using key two underscore X and key two underscore Y, we are using the suffix that we specified. And the pandas merge function has a lot of additional function arguments available. List is here. So we saw left and right, for example, before to merge the data frame on the left on the right side. The how argument is quite important to specify which type of join we want to apply, inner, outer, left or right. And of course, on to specify which column to join on. We can also merge on index. There are cases where the merge key in the data frame will be found in its index, so in the row labels. And in this case, we can specify that either the left index or the right index should be true in order to specify that the index should be used as a merge key. Let's have a look at an example. We're going to specify a data frame with two columns, key and value. And then we're going to create a second data frame called right one with a single column. And here we can see our left one data frame with two columns, key and value, and our right one data frame with a single column. Now, in order to merge our data frame on the right side, we can go ahead and we can use the merge function as before, specifying our two data frames, left one and right one. And by specifying a left on and setting it to key, we're saying that the columns in the left data frame should be used as join keys. And then we're also setting right index to true to use a row index in the right side of the data frame as join keys. And since we did not specify the how attribute, we are using the default inner join. So we can see our keys and values here and also the group value for the keys A and B. And since for key C inside of the left one data frame, there was not a corresponding key in the second data frame. This was dropped by our inner join. 
But if you want to avoid that, we can of course use an outer join instead. And this way, our key C is also included. And since key C does not exist in the second data frame, we would get not a number back for our group value from the second data frame. An alternative approach to combining data is concatenating or stacking. And for that, we can use NumPy's concatenate function, which works on NumPy arrays. So let's have a look at an example. We're going to use NumPy's A range method to create values from 0 to 11. And then we're going to use the reshape method to create a 3 by 4 array. Let's have a look at our array. And here we can see the values from 0 to 11. And inside of that array, we have three lists with four values each. And now we can go ahead and we can use the concatenate function. We're passing our array to it. And in fact, we are passing the array to it twice. So we're basically combining the array with itself. And we specify that we want to do that along axis one. So looking at the result, we can see that for each of the individual lists inside of the array, the original values are added again. So 0, 1, 2, 3 is added again. And the same, of course, is true for the other list entries here. Now, concatenating array objects is quite straightforward. But if you're working with pandas objects, such as series and data frame objects, we have labeled axes, and therefore we have some additional concerns that we need to address. So first of all, if the objects are indexed differently on the other axis, the question is whether we should combine the different elements in these axes, or if we should only use the values. We also need to address whether the data that has been concatenated needs to be identified as such or not. And we need to also address whether the concatenation axis that's being used contains data that we need to preserve. So let's jump into IPython to address each one of those three different concerns. So first of all, to start out, we are going to create a series object here called S1. And then we're gonna create two additional series objects, S2, as well as the third object, S3. So if we now look at S1, S2, and S3, we can see these are very simple series objects with two, three, and two rows respectively, all of type in 64. And now in order to join multiple of those series objects together, we can use pandas concat method. And here we're specifying our three different series objects inside of a list. And by default, pandas concat method works along the index axis and produces another series object. If instead we want to create a data frame, we would use the concat method, but specify the optional axis element and set it to columns. So in this case, when we generate a data frame, there's no overlap on the other axis. Instead of working with series object, we can of course also work with data frame objects. So here we are creating a data frame DF1 and then a second data frame DF2. And looking at DF1 and DF2, we can see that we have two columns and three rows for the first data frame and two columns and two rows for the second data frame. Now to combine those two data frames, we can again use the concatenate method. And here we are specifying our two data frames to join. We specify that the axis should be along the columns. So we get a data frame back and we're using the keys argument to create a hierarchical index, setting the values to level one and level two. And now we get our combined data frame back with level one for our first data frame and level two for a second data frame that has been joined together. And there are a number of different function arguments available for a pandas concat function. We saw, for example, the axis argument before to specify which axis should be used for the concatenation. We saw join to perform either an inner or outer join. And of course, levels to specify the indexes that should be used as a hierarchical index. Now there's an additional way to combine data in addition to merge and concatenation. And we would use it when we have two data sets with indexes that overlap in full or partially. So for an example, let's create two series objects. The first one called A and the second one called B. Now looking at A and B, we can see we have a number of missing values included in our series objects that we created. Now taking the series objects A and B as a starting point, we can use NumPy's where function in order to determine whenever a value is not available in A, that instead we want to replace it with a value in B. So this is going to give us back this result, 0, 2.5, 0, 3.5, 4.5, and 5. And looking at A again, we can see that the first value is not available, so it would be replaced with a value in B. Then the second value is 2.5, which we can see here. Third value is 0, then 3.5, then 4.5, and the last value here is set to 5, because looking at that, that would be the corresponding value inside of B. But the where function actually does not check the index. The index is actually not required. So when we want to check whether the index labels are aligned, we first need to combine A and B. 
by using the combine first method. So if we want to make sure that the index labels are aligned, we need to use the combine first method. So in this result, first of all, we are sorting it alphabetically based on the values. And then whenever we replace a value in A, which is not set with a associated value in B, the value label is considered. So comparing that to A, we can see that A is not set, then set to zero because that's the corresponding value in B. And then the values for B, C, D, and E are set, so they're displayed accordingly. And for F, again, the value is missing, so we would use the corresponding value in B, which is five. When we work with data frames, the combined first method does the same thing column by column. So we can think of it as patching the missing data in the calling object with data from the object that we pass. So as an example, let's create two data frames, data frame one and data frame two. And looking at data frame one and data frame two, we can see a number of different values are missing. And as with the series object, we can use the combined first method to combine data frame one with data frame two. So whenever a value is missing inside of data frame one, it would be replaced with the associated value in data frame two. So for instance, inside of data frame one, the value at index one in column A was set to not a number. And also at index three in column one, that value was also missing. And those values have then been replaced with the associated values inside of data frame two. We also have a number of basic operations for rearranging tabular data. And those are called reshape or pivot operations. And the first of those operations we're going to cover is reshaping with hierarchical indexing. So when we want to rearrange data in a data frame, we have two primary actions. The first one is stack that rotates or pivots from the columns in the data to the rows. And then we have unstack, which pivots from the rows into the columns. And of course, we saw examples of both of those already before. Let's have a look at an example. We are creating a data frame data. And if you look at that, we can see we have a data frame with three columns and two rows. And we could now go ahead and use the stack method to pivot the columns into the rows to produce a series object. So here we're calling stack on our data object, storing that back in the result. And if you look at result, we can see we created a series object. And of course we could take that series object and turn it back into a data frame object by using the unstack method instead. So this is again going to create the original data frame that we had. Now when we work with time series, a common way to store those in databases or CSV files is to use a long or stacked format. And in that format, individual values are represented by a single row and table rather than as multiple values per row. Let's work with some example data. And for that, you can head over to the books resources on GitHub, link also in the description down below, and download the books resources. We then need to unzip the file and move it to our working directory. And then we can go ahead and we can use pandas read CSV function in order to read the data that's contained inside of the examples folder in the file macrodata.csv. Let's next have a look at some specific columns. And then we can have a look at the beginning of the data by using the head method. So here we see some GDP data, inflation data, and unemployment figures for multiple years. Now in order to combine the data into a long format, we can start out by combining the data for the first two columns, so the year and the quarter. In order to do that, we can use pandas period index method to combine the values for the year and the quarter, and to set the index to consist of daytime values at the end of each quarter. So looking at the periods we just created, we can now see the year and after that, the respective quarter combined into a single value. Next up, we can use the two timestep method in order to turn our period values into a timestamp, which we are then going to associate with our index for our data frame. And now if we take another look at our data, we can now see that we indeed combined the year and the quarter column and instead our date is displayed. And we also got rid of our default index. Instead, we are using our daytime index as a new index. Next up, we can select a subset of our columns, real GDP, inflation, and unemployment. And then we can set the name for those columns to item. And if we take another look at our data frame, we can see that we added that additional label to our data frame. And next up, we can reduce the number of columns further by setting item as a new column and then displaying our date index the item and the associated value for real GDP, inflation, or unemployment. For that, we're first going to call the stack method on our data frame. Then we are going to reset its index and then rename the columns to value. Now we can take a look at the first 10 values and we can see that now we have three columns, our data frame, the item, which includes real GDP, inflation, and unemployment, and then the associated value. 
So in this long format for multiple time series, each row in our table reflects a single observation, such as real GDP or unemployment. And data is often stored in this way in relational SQL databases, because a fixed schema with the column names and data types allows the number of distinct values in the item column to change as data is added to the table. So in this case, date and item would usually be the primary keys if we compare two relational databases, and that makes it a lot easier to join. But we might still prefer to have separate columns for those different values, such as real GDP, inflation, and unemployment. And for that, we can simply use our data frame and call the pivot method, passing our index, the columns, and the values as arguments. And now if we have a look at our updated data frame, we can see that again, we have our date here and then our three columns, inflation, real GDP and unemployment. So using the pivot method, we can very easily switch between the long format and then this more readable format. Now, basically the inverse operation of using pivot for data frames is pandas melt function. And instead of turning one columns into many as pivoted, it merges multiple columns into one. So it results in a data frame that is longer than the input. And let's have a look at an example. Here we can create a new data frame with four different columns, a key column, and then the columns A, B, and C. So looking at our data frame, this is basically what it looks like. And our key column here is basically a group indicator, and the other columns A, B, and C are data values. So when we're using pandas melt function, we must specify which columns are group indicators. In this case, we're going to use key. So here we can use a melt function, which is part of pandas, of course. We're going to provide our data frame as an argument, and then we are going to specify the group indicators, and we're going to set that to key. Now looking at our result, we can see that we now have our three columns, A, B, and C, included in the variable column, and the associated value is displayed right next to it. So again, it helps us to reduce the number of columns we're working with. And again, if we want to undo that, we simply would use a pivot method. And again, we are going to specify the index as key, the columns, in this case variable, and then our values, which is set to value. And looking at the result, we can see that we get the original structure back. Now, since pivot is going to create an index from the column used as the row labels, we could use the reset index method to move the data back into a column. So doing that, we can see that key is now its own column and instead we have a separate index displayed in front. We can also specify a subset of values to use as value columns. So in this case, we are specifying A and B. And this way, when we use the melt function, actually only the values for A and B will be displayed with the associated value. And we can also use a melt function without any group identifier. So here we are only providing the data frame as an argument as well as the different value columns. We covered how we can analyze our data using pandas. Now that we understand how we can import, clean, and organize our data using pandas, we're going to visualize our data next. In the next video, we're going to cover matplotlib, and we are going to learn how we can use it in order to visualize our data. Feel free to subscribe to the channel to not miss any videos, and see you guys in the next video.